Welcome to another video as part of Key Area 2.3, the Biology of Control and Fertility. And in this one, we'll look at the process of in vitro fertilisation. If you haven't already done so, I do recommend watching going over the infertility treatments first, as these go kind of hand in hand. So the process of in vitro fertilisation, IVF, involves the surgical removal of eggs following that hormonal stimulation to cause that superovulation. So that there are multiple eggs maturing and can be collected. The eggs will then be mixed with the sperm in a petri dish, with fertilisation occurring naturally. Now that we have the zygote, it will be incubated, normally allowed to develop until it's at least eight cells and in the embryonic stage before being implanted directly into the uterus. There are also a couple of other techniques that can be used in conjunction with the IVF. So things like the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, so before the embryo is implanted into the uterus, and this is used to identify single gene disorders or chromosomal abnormalities. So if somebody maybe has a family history or is been previously identified to be in high risk for one of these inherited conditions, then PGD is something that could be used alongside the IVF to ensure that only the healthy embryos are the ones being implanted. Another technique that could be used is the intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And this is particularly helpful if there is problems with the sperm quality or if they're in very low numbers. So ICS again can be used alongside the IVF process. So this involves selecting one of the healthy sperms. So the head where the genetic material is located will be drawn into a needle and injected directly into the egg cell. And this is to improve the odds of fertilization. From that point, the IVF process will continue as previously detailed. So let's try some of our past paper questions. So pause the video and see if you can answer this question. So this time we're told some women undergoing IVF consent pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD, of their embryos. So explain why PGD is offered to some women. So why isn't it? used all the time with IVF, what are kind of the benefits or the reasons it would be offered. So a few different options. So either talking about exactly what PGD does, well it identifies genetic disorders or chromosome abnormalities. And you've got a lot of options here how you could phrase or word this. So genetic diseases, inherited diseases, genetic mutations, genetic conditions. Or you may have chose to focus on that family history, a parent, a family member already having the genetic disorder, chromosome abnormality, again with options on the phrasing. Or the biological tests that have indicated that there's potentially a genetic disorder, chromosome abnormality, again, phrase that how you like. But if you do go down that road, make sure that you do not suggest it's the PGD that is identifying the risk or the likelihood. So the D diagnosis is not a screening, it's a confirmation of the presence of a disorder. Or you could be thinking about the outcome, so it's to ensure that the embryo fetus baby child does not have that genetic disorder or chromosomal abnormality. We'll try some problem solving that could come up in this area as well. So again, pause the video and see what you come up with. By now we should be getting a drill that when we see that we've got a graph question that we're always taking that little bit of time just to start by familiarising ourselves with what the graph shows with the key before we even attempt to tackle the specific questions. So we can see here we've got the age going up versus the rate and percentages of first the dots of the pregnancy rate, so the percentage of pregnancies versus across 
the percentage of births. Okay. So once we're familiar with our graph, we can start looking at our specific questions. So state one similarity and one difference in the trends for the pregnancy and birth rates. Okay. So we're looking at the, the big picture here, comparing these two values. So we see kind of going up and then both starting to come back down. So a similarity could be that they both increase until 28 years, or they both decrease from that point, or that they both peak at 28 years, or same age was acceptable as well. So as long as you're looking at the trends, the patterns, the big picture, and not getting too focused on one individual data point. Uh, so let's try then the differences. Well, we could have had the pregnancy rate is higher than the birth rate, or the converse, that the birth rate is always lower than the pregnancy rate. Or we could have said the pregnancy rate increases faster than the birth rate up to that 28 year mark, or that the birth rate decreases to zero while the pregnancy rate does not. Okay. Again, usually lots of different ways you can pick up, in this case, the two marks. Let's try the other question. Calculate how many 34 year old women in a sample of 1000 would be predicted to get pregnant using IVF. So we're looking at the 34 age range and because we know our graph already states it as a percentage, so we're looking for what's the percentage of 34 year old women who get pregnant using IVF. So pregnancy rate is a dot, come up till we find the pregnancy rate, which is sitting at 35%. So for ones have actually given us quite nice numbers, 35% of 1,000 for 350. Okay. So I hope that it's helped give you some insight into the IVF process. But as always, please just let me know if you do have any further questions.